So um, today we're going to talk about structural heart interventions um, uh, on uh, structural heart diseases, uh, some of the lessons learned from uh, recent trials. Um, so the need uh, and some of the caveats of structural heart intervention, um, let's discuss them first. So basically, uh, some of the population-based analysis reveal that the prevalence of uh, moderate to severe uh, mitral and tricuspid valve diseases is very high in the elderly population. The mitral valve disease almost uh, is at 10%, and the tricuspid valve diseases in the elderly uh, exceeds a uh, prevalence of 4%. Um, only a small uh, number of patients enrolled uh, in many of these studies and trials. Um, uh, you know, they, they limit the, the data that's available to understand the real world uh, clinical impact. And so the ability to verify uh, the impact of these limited num number of patient studies uh, is, is very challenging. Further, uh, there is limited randomized uh, data that is available to compare these transcatheter therapies with optimal uh, goal-directed medical therapies. And so what we've learned from our experience is that um, what's key to structural heart interventions is good quality imaging, optimal patient selection, timing of the intervention, and appropriate device selection. A lot of these factors are controlled for uh, in, uh, in a lot of the studies and trials that we're going to discuss hereafter. But in the real world, it's easy to forget that you have to have uh, all these ingredients to have the perfect recipe. So patient selection, uh, ensuring that the quality of the image is good, uh, timing the intervention, and device selection, again, is, is critical. And this usually involves uh, multidisciplinary planning. So we'll start with uh, some of the mitral valve interventions. Transcatheter um, edge to edge repair, also called TIR, is now the standard um, of care for patients with symptomatic functional mitral regurgitation or FMR. Those who have MR uh, despite guideline directed medical suggested a class 2A recommendation uh, for uh, select primary MR. Uh, while the 2021 European Society of Cardiology and Cardiac Surgery uh, gave a class 2B recommendation for uh, use of tear in uh, primary MR. Further, a new class 2A indication uh, has been recommended by both ACCHA and the European guidelines for functional MR patients. Um, so more than 33,000 uh, patients have received a uh, tier for the mitral valve disease now uh, that's using the mitral clip. And uh, with continuously improving 30-day uh, mortality, which is now less than 5%, uh, and a surprising average length of stay of just about one day. Now, the Abbott MitroClip is the first transcatheter technology with the CE mark and FDA approval for treatment of both primary and secondary MR. Since its first implantation in 2003, over 100,000 procedures have been performed worldwide. The COAP study uh, that randomized patients uh, with heart failure and moderate to severe or severe functional MR who remained symptomatic on gold retinal medical therapy came out with three-year outcomes last year. It showed a sustained three-year improvement in mitral regurgitation severity, quality of life, and functional capacity. The analyzed heart failure hospitalization rates in these patients remained low at 35% compared to 69% of gold retinal medical therapy, and the mortality was also low at 42% compared to 55%. So it just highlights the, uh, the significance of uh, this procedure compared to guideline directed medical therapy. Now, the patients that had uh, crossed over from the medical therapy arm to the tier group uh, also actually had improved uh, both mortality and heart failure hospitalization, which is very significant. 
Now, again, the key here is patient selection. The difference between the COAPT and the MITRA FR trial that had come out, uh, it, it basically assisted us in development of a new physiologic concept of proportional versus disproportional MITRA regurgitation. Uh, and the concept is based on the fact that the effective regurgitant orifice area or the EROA depends on a lot of factors such as the LV and diastolic volume, the ejection fraction, the regurgitant fraction, and the velocity time integral of the, uh, of the mitral regurgitation. Now, one of the largest contemporary real-world study of mitroclip called the mitral, mitroclip expand study came out as well. Uh, this shows effectiveness of the mitroclip uh, and the MR reduction in almost about 90% of patients at one year and a significantly reduced uh, uh, re reduction in uh, heart failure hospitalizations at one year as well with excellent safety profile. So this is one of the largest real world um, studies that we have uh, looking at the mitroclip. Um, now from other studies, we have also learned a little bit about uh, some predictors of uh, mitroclip outcome. Uh, primarily age less than 75 years, uh, lower serum creatinine, um, low LV and diastolic volume and the absence of Diabetes, hemodynamic instability, uh, and atrial fibrillation and COPD are associated with good outcome. Other sub-studies uh, sub of the COAPT have also shown that a residual MR greater than three uh, plus is associated with worsened uh, mortality at uh, 30 days uh, and also at two years. Uh, further, we also understood that gender-specific impact of tear in heart failure hospitalization treatment, the benefit was less pronounced in women when compared to men beyond the first year after treatment. Further, the role of tear compared to surgical mitral valve replacement in post-MI was also evaluated in another retrospective study of about 500 patients. These patients had at least moderate to severe MR following my, uh, a myocardial infarction. The immediate procedural success did not differ in the two groups. However, the in-hospital and the one-year um, the one-year uh, mortality rates were significantly higher in the surgical mitral valve replacement uh, rather than in, in the uh, repair or replacement rather than the tier group. So tier came out a little bit better in overall uh, mortality in these patients. Now, unfortunately, if the mitral clip fails and the patients need surgery, uh, there is dismal outlook. The cutting edge registry of about 300 patients uh, looked at mitral valve surgery needed uh, if, uh, if the edge-to-edge -edge repair of the tear failed. Uh, the mortality rate remained high at about 24% at one year and 30%, over 30% at three years after the mitral valve surgery. What's also interesting is that uh, there was a very low rate of mitral valve repair possibility in these patients, just about, just about under 10%. Further, uh, two retros retrospective studies also suggest that uh, this procedure of end-to-end -end, uh, repair can be safely performed with moderate sedation. Um, just, you know, a, a promising evolution of, of where these procedures are headed. Uh, next, uh, we're going to discuss the Edward Pascal system that also gained CE mark in uh, 2009, uh, February, for the treatment of both primary and secondary uh, MR and the CLASP study uh, also came out with its two-year outcomes uh, recently. Now, again, to, to remember, this is an observational study of about over 100 patients, and the results show sustained favorable, favorable outcomes with a very high survival rate of about 72% uh, for, for functional MR and over 90% for primary MR and uh, high uh, freedom from heart failure hospitalization rates as well. The Pascal device, as of um, a month ago, uh, at the TCT was given uh, FDA approval for uh, degenerative mitral uh, regurgitation. Now, let's discuss transcatheter mitral valve replacements, or TMVR. Compared to tier or edge-to-edge -edge repair, um, the field of TMVR is still pretty much in its infancy. And this is mainly limited by high rates of screening failure due to unsuitable anatomy. So the first study we'll discuss that came out uh, is the Tendine, the Abbott's Tendine valve as shown in the image, uh, came out with this two-year outcomes 
that showed an all-cause mortality of 39%. Sounds high. It is a very sick population. It was about 43% at 90 days. Uh, but 90% of these patients that uh, survived did not have uh, MR, and they also showed decrease in, in heart failure hospitaliz hospitalization, so that's promising. Uh, several other devices are currently being evaluated for uh, TMDR, such as the, uh, the Intrapid uh, by Medtronic, uh, for which favorable results have been reported in pivotal study, but there's no big study that has really uh, uh, been revealed. Uh, next, we'll look at the TMVR or TMVI for valve and valve, valve and uh, ring, and valve and MAC cases. Uh, the one-year outcome of a small study called MITRAL trial uh, came out, which looked at mitral valve and valve with Sapien 3 in high-risk patients with a 100% success rate and a low complication rate and a low mortality as well. A larger study looking at valve and valve and valve and ring, almost uh, a thousand patients collected, uh, followed these patients up for over a year. Uh, median age uh, of uh, time for follow-up was about 500 days. Um, again, primarily these procedures were performed uh, transapically, which is 62%. And now we're actually seeing this trend reverse over the last few years. We're doing a lot more procedures transvenous and transseptally. Uh, this looked at uh, overall technical success rate, which was very high, uh, and uh, a lower risk, a lower rate of residual uh, MR, um, and a high four-year survival. And the survival was higher in the valve and valve patients compared to the valve and ring patient, which is not a surprise. Also, the residual mean gradient greater than five was still very high in these patients at about 60%. The overall uh, risk of LVOT obstruction or mispositioning was extremely low, under 3%. Similar to this study, another large study looked at three different settings of about uh, 500 patients. And this is also looking at patients with valve and MAC. Uh, transapical was again the preferred axis. Again, we are seeing a reversal of this trend and seeing more transfemoral use. The valve and valve patients actually had a very low 30 day and one year mortality and a very low adverse event rate, just about two to 3%. Compared to that, the valve and ring patients had a slightly higher 30 day and one year mortality, but the worst were the valve and MAC uh, patients. These patients had a high 35% 30 day mortality and uh, uh, pardon that a 62% uh, uh, one year mortality. Uh, also the, the rate of residual MR and valve embolization was also high, but what's key here is the LVOT obstruction, almost at 40%, which basically drove most of these uh, uh, of the morbidity in these patients. Now, better result for TAVR in the MAC uh, category came out from this global registry study in which the LVOT obstruction was just about 11%. So this kind of also explains that as we are progressively learning more about the procedure and you know we're using more uh, advanced uh, uh, imaging technologies and you know using CT and uh, AI-based systems to predict LVOT obstruction, some of these will eventually, complication rates will eventually come down. Uh, let's quickly discuss tricuspid valve interventions. So tricuspid valve interventions is very interesting. It is estimated that uh, over a million people in the United States have uh, functional tricuspid uh, regurgitations. The prevalence is very high. So there's definitely need to understand and learn more about, about these interventions. Um, now the tricuspid valve has some anatomic challenges. It may seem like it's, a, it's the most easily accessible valve. Uh, you know, you don't have to do arterial access nor you have to do septal crossing, but it has its own set of unique challenges. And the first one is anatomically, it has a lot of complex subalveolar components. It has multiple chordae, uh, chordae tendinae and papillary muscles, which really increases the risk of entrapment and hindering uh, device maneuverability uh, under the valve. And it is a less understood uh, uh, D-shaped annulus uh, valve, which is very dynamic both during the cardiac cycle and also uh, changes significantly with, with disease progression. It also has a close anatomic relationship with the septal uh, tricuspid analyst and the AV node and his system. So the risk of new onset or worsening conduction uh, abnormalities is high. Also the role of optimal medical therapy, again, is not really addressed by any of the guidelines. So while the diuretics um, and ACE inhibitors, they do provide some symptomatic relief, there's, they haven't really shown any 
uh, prognostic benefit in right heart disease. So comparison to interventions, we don't really have much information in head-on comparison with, uh, with medical therapy. Um, overall, percutaneous uh, tricuspid valve interventions so far have a really good procedural success rate, over 90%. It is associated with good survival and reduced heart failure hospitalizations. Um, there is a low complication risk in most of these procedures, just about 2%, um, and the average 30-day mortality of about 5%. The other problem with a lot of these interventions is the definition of procedural success, because uh, the definition used in a lot of, a lot of uh, studies that we mentioned uses greater than one TR grade reduction as procedural success. And there's also a discrepancy in this reduction in TR uh, or the correlation of tricuspid regurgitation with improvement in functional class. So although the TR may just reduce by one grade, um, the, the improvement in the patient's functional class is quite significant. So we haven't quite gotten our head around this concept that, you know, how just reduction of TR grade by one is translated into uh, clinical success or uh, technical success. So let's discuss the tier technologies, edge-to-edge -edge repair technology for the tricuspid valve. So there are no currently FD-approved transcatheter modalities. Um, the biggest one is the TriClip, which is by Abbott, the Triluminate study. And um, it was uh, in September, 2022, that uh, part of their um, study outcomes came out, uh, the one-year outcomes. And it found that the TriClip was safe and effective in patients with moderate or greater uh, TR. 75% of the patients uh, were in class three or four. So these are very sick patients. And they had a reduction in TR severity um, in about 90% of these patients. Um, most of these patients, again, 90%, ended up in NYHA class one or two with significantly improved uh, functional class uh, and also reduced uh, six minute walking uh, distance. The event rate, all cause mortality was low, just about 7%. Um, and uh, the functional status improvement was quite significant in these patients. So we're again, keeping with those uh, definitions of reduction in TR and improved functional class. Uh, the MitroClip XDR was also studied in about 30 patients uh, for the tricuspid air, um, uh, region. Uh, in these patients, the captation gap is more than seven millimeters in about half of them. And this is significant because over time, we realized that over seven millimeters and under 10 is kind of like the tricky area where it gets challenging to have technical success or significant reduction in tricuspid regurgitation. Over 10 millimeters is something that becomes very, very challenging and may need uh, you know, a revised thought process about uh, valve replacement instead of valve repair. Uh, the procedural success in the MitroClip XTR was also high, about 90%. Um, and there was a high rate of single leaflet um, uh, uh, SLDA in, uh, in about 25% um, of the patients. Uh, next, we look at the CLASP uh, study, which uh, is basically looking at a PASCAL device for the tricuspid. Uh, here, we saw that the patients had a substantial reduction in TR, functional class, and quality of life with a very low event rate or need for intervention. The PASCAL device has also been studied in the United States in a small compassionate use um, study and again, showed uh, significant um, survival and reduction in functional class, minimal complication. So the class uh, TR second study is a bigger randomized study, which uh, is gonna be looking at uh, the PASCAL device versus uh, medical therapy alone. Now let's discuss some analoplasty techniques for the tricuspid. Uh, cardio band, uh, the tri band was the biggest uh, study that came out showed a low 30 day mortality and a high uh, rate of bleeding events. So uh, this was um, the challenge in, in cardio band. The bleeding rates, systemic bleeding rates were high. A majority of these patients experienced improved uh, TR grade by at least uh, one. Um, and um, the six months uh, data from early feasibility uh, study uh, showing high uh, improvement and annular dimension reduction. So basically what the device does is that it's a contraction wire and a polyester fabric that is cinched to reduce the AP and septolateral diameters. So you can look at those outcomes of 20% reduction in the annular dimension. So this is something that the edge-to-edge -edge repair does not address. 
And also what's going to be important in the future is to identify patients that would probably benefit from an aneuploplasty in combination with an edge to edge repair. The tri-line device uh, is also undergoing a uh, study uh, named the SCOUT trial. Uh, preliminary uh, results came out looking at one TR grade reduction, uh, no high complication rate and a decent technical uh, success rate in these patients as well. Now valve replacement for the tricuspid, again, there are quite a few uh, devices that are on our market. The biggest one uh, trial that came out um, last year was the TriSend trial. This was about 100 patients, and the six-month follow-up was available with high technical success rate, a uh, high TR uh, reduction um, uh, in 100% of these patients, reduced to mild or less, and the improved functional and quality of outcomes were very, very significant um, in these patients. Freedom from heart failure was also over 90, 95%. Now the TRISEN-2 randomized trial is underway and uh, we are also enrolled here at uh, Beth Israel Deaconess. These are some of the other orth orth uh, orthotopic bioprosthesis that are available. Uh, and this is the, um, uh, the Evoke valve. Uh, this is a gate system. Uh, this is built by the Navigate uh, company in California. It's a self-expanding bioprosthesis. Um, the Lux valve uh, is actually uh, from China. It's a tri-leaflet bovine pericardium valve and it's delivered uh, through a thoracotomy and uh, now it's coming also through a transatrial approach. Um, this is a sapien valve that we know and the trick in the tricento are cable valves, which we'll discuss. Um, heterotopic bioprosthesis is cable implantation. Uh, basically what it does, it reduces heart failure symptoms and, um, and volume overload. Specific anatomy um, is required to pass for a cable implantation. For example, if your tricuspid annulus is too big, the annular dilation is too big for a TMBR or patient has pacemaker wires, so you cannot implant a new valve, then this is one of the options so you can do. Uh, most of the valves used here, again, are the sapien valves. And there are two trials that are underway, the tri-cable and the hover trial, which is also looking at um, you know, high um, success rate, but the risk of uh, valve dislocation is there and the tri-cable study the rate of valve dislocation was very high, about 30%. So one in three valves was getting dislocated. So it was DC. The hover trial is still currently underway. Again, these are for very high risk surgical patients only currently. So this, you can see the spread of all the tricuspid interventions currently taking place. Two thirds are still triclip or the mitroclip and only about 15% are getting endoplasty. But as more and more of these devices come out, you might see a, a shift in the trends. Uh, quickly, the aortic valve interventions. The main study that came out uh, was the Partner 3 two year follow up, uh, great primary endpoint reduction, and the initial difference of death and stroke that was favoring the TAVR uh, is all, although reduced, but it's still present. Uh, the TAVR unfortunately also showed an increased risk of valve thrombosis uh, over a two year period of time. Uh, similar um, to, the, to the Partner 3. Uh, Tavra valve, we have the two-year follow-up from the Evolute low-risk trial and the low-risk patients. Again, the primary outcome uh, was favoring Tavra compared to the surgical uh, valve replacement, although this was not statistically significant. And the need for permanent pacemaker with the Evolute was much higher. It's about 20% compared to 8% in the surgical uh, valve. And finally, the five-year follow-up of the sirt Havi valve also came out. This was the RCT of over 1,600 patients, intermediate risk patients. Again, the first two were the low risk, Sertavi's intermediate risk patients. And here, the rate of uh, all cause mortality or disabling stroke was no different between TAVR and SAVR at five years. The primary outcome, there was no difference at five years. So it's a very interesting trend because, um, you know, when you compare TAVR to SAVR, obviously you can see that most of the benefit and primary endpoint, which is reduction in all-cause mortality, death, stroke, is much, the, the difference is much higher earlier in the first 30 days and up to a year. And as you see more data come out, you know, over two, three, five years, we might start to see a decrease in the benefit over a period of time. Uh, the avatar trial, the big trial, um, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. It looked at early surgical um, aortic valve uh, replacement versus conservative management showed a, a good primary composite endpoint of actually reduction in heart failure uh, and all-cause mortality 
uh, both to improve outcomes, primarily driven by decrease in the heart failure hospitalizations. Next, we look at uh, TAVR use in bicuspid aortic valves. These are low risk patients who have bicuspid uh, aortic stenosis. Uh, TAVR appeared to be safe with short length of hospital stay, uh, stay literally zero mortality and no disabling strokes. Uh, and another meta-analysis uh, of the FDA of the FDA approved trials of low risk patients with bicuspid AS also showed uh, uh, comparable results uh, and safety in patients who have um, who are using TAVR. Now, uh, partner three sub-study also showed TAVR outcome worse in atrial fibrillation. So the, again, something to think about that patients who had atrial fibrillation had a higher risk for a composite outcome of death stroke or hospitalization. So to summarize, we had a sustained two-year benefits in low-risk patients. We did have sustained five-year benefits for intermediate-risk patients, but again, this benefit was much less uh, compared to the first 30 to one year and that effectiveness of TAVR in bicuspid aortic valve uh, is established even in lower risk patients. And finally, we look at the left atrial appendage interventions. Uh, the AMULET device basically got FDA approved last year. Uh, this was followed by the AMULET IDE trial, which compared the AMULET uh, and Watchman for non-inferiority. Basically, the primary safety endpoint was achieved in both, and it, it proved that the AMULET device was, in fact, non-inferior to Watchmen. They had similar uh, bleeding uh, rate and very similar all-cause mortality. Uh, and the left atrial occlusion rate was actually much better in the amulet uh, compared to Watchmen. Procedure-related complication was slightly higher in amulet compared to Watchmen, but again, very similar. So now we have another great device you know, for left atrial appendage closure. Um, Meta-analysis of 40 studies also showed that intracardiac echo guidance for implantation uh, of these appendage closure devices is safe while it reduces exposure to general anesthesia and associated uh, possible risks with that. Uh, two retrospective studies also suggest that left atrial appendage occlusion uh, can be performed with moderate conscious sedation with same day discharge. So we are seeing a trend in a lot of these appendage closures being done with uh, 3D uh, uh, ice guidance uh, as you probably experienced at most of your centers. There are also studies that are comparing uh, patients who are getting the appendage closure at the same time as atrial fibrillation ablation, and they're getting good results with long-term success rates, almost 100% uh, ceiling rate of the left atrial appendage, uh, and about 70% uh, long-term freedom from arrhythmia. And lastly, the four-year outcomes from the uh, trial uh, looking at the left atrial appendage closure versus um, oral anticoagulants came out, which showed that the appendage closure was non-inferior um, uh, to, uh, to oral anticoagulants. So we're seeing a, a lot more patients that are gonna be referred for these appendage closures. And finally, we are experiencing more of the flex device. I think most institutions have almost 100% converted to the Watchman flex device. The Pinnacle flex study that came out in the last two years showed uh, a primary effectiveness in 100% of the patients and a very, very low complication rate. So all in all, we're doing some really good work in structural heart. Uh, there's so many ongoing trials and I could barely cover probably, you know, half of all, all the things that have been going in the past uh, two, three years, but I hope that the review was helpful for you to understand where we are, some of the challenges and the caveats uh, and what the, and, and where we're going to be uh, going to the future. All right. Thank you. Without taking more time, I'll pass along back to Azal. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Sankal, for that detailed review. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, one is, uh, one of the issues that comes up often with a structural heart disease intervention is uh, this topic of in, uh, indication creep, that a lot of these devices were initially tested on pretty frail patients. And as the technical challenges got ironed out a bit, as the uh, operators got more trained, they started applying these to more and more patients who were really out, very much outside the demographic for which the trials were done. Uh, and then as sort of more evidence grows, there may be sort of a bit of a stepping back. Uh, in your practice, are you seeing much of a stepping, a stepping back with any of these devices based on newer evidence to kind of clarify exactly where the line is? Or are you kind of continuing to see the patient population grow despite the, in a way that's incommensurate with the evidence base? 
So I think it's a double-edged sword because uh, a lot of these studies have very stringent uh, inclusion criteria, right? So we, we took patients that are very, very sick. We took patients that have uh, you know, no chance of getting a surgery, but at the same time, we ensured that their imaging is perfect, is pristine. I mean, we have, you know, a panel sitting and discussing patient imaging, whether these patients should be enrolled or not. So uh, when you take these very sick patients, but, you know, you know, line up perfect imaging, perfect device selection, uh, and, you know, uh, in, in high volume centers where most of these trials are conducted, you get a certain outcome. Now, when you change, um, and, and one thing also to remember is that they also have a very uh, expert uh, referral group. You know, you have advanced heart failure practitioners that are, you know, that are assessing these patients, making sure these patients are optimized on medical therapy before they're going for interventions. The real world population is much different. You know, we are extending some of the uses, uh, you know, practically to uh, maybe slightly lower risk patients. So we are seeing an increasing pool uh, and we are also seeing patients that have that are not, you know, perfectly screened for imaging, for again device selection. We're not, you know, doing panel discussions about, you know, who who are we bringing in for this. So there's a there's a there's a difference in the population that was enrolled in these trials versus real world population, and you have to be careful about a lot of these outcomes. Uh, as I was showing that, you know, some of the real world data. Uh, overlaps in, for example, the mitroclip, but some don't, like the complication rate may be, may be much low. So depending on, you know, advanced referral group, the technical um, skills of the, of the group that's, uh, that's performing the procedure, uh, experience of, the, of both the interventionalist and the, the imaging uh, cardiographer, uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be interesting to see how, how you know, more data comes out and how, how structural interventions evolve. I think one of the challenges is to see whether enough effort and research are put towards analyzing that data, because we have a lot of patients who can have surgery, open surgery safely, and it's not difficult to sell an interventional procedure to a patient because from their perspective, it's obviously much easier and much quicker procedure, but we really don't have a lot of open questions about the long-term outcomes. Uh, the Watchman device is, a, you know, as you know, is pretty controversial whether uh, the indications for which it's being applied are really valid and to have a new device then be compared to the watchman for non-inferiority raises a lot of concerns about sort of where we're where we're going with this uh, marcus are there any other questions that you wanted to ask yeah i just wanted to ask uh, one question Sankal. you you had mentioned that you were starting to be able to maybe do mitral clips or edge to edge repair under conscious sedation is that i'm assuming that's going to be done with ice or intracardiac echo as the main imaging modality and has there been any comparison of ice versus te for for long-term um outcomes in terms of the repair quality? Yeah, there's no, uh, I mean, again, ICE use for any of these, uh, you know, since the advent of 3D ICE uh, is literally in its infancy. You know, we're seeing, uh, you know, some of the most advanced centers having six months or less experience with ICE. So, uh, and it's still requiring, uh, you know, a lot of technical challenges, uh, basically a couple of expert representatives from the company to come and guide, uh, you know, knobs and imaging and, you know, rotation and, and acquiring images. And, and we know that I, from our experience, you know, ICE is for, for let's say appendage closure. It's not, it's not perfect, you know, in, in eight to nine out of 10 cases, you'll be able to achieve, but then even with your best maneuvering, you know, you may not be able to, to achieve the goal for something like uh, intraatrial septal closure. It might be, you know, more uh, technically apt to use ICE uh, than TE. So no study really has uh, looked at head-to-head uh, -head comparison of T versus ICE to answer your question. Uh, but I think, again, most people haven't started using ICE for these procedures. So again, I think that it's, it's a matter of time, in my opinion, um, as ICE gets better, you know, the, the far field resolution is still uh, limited in ICE. It's, it's not perfect. Uh, but as, again, the, the technology advances with that, we might be we might be headed in, the, in that direction. Thanks so much. Just to follow up on that, in your uh, group, who's responsible for the ice? The cardiologists or is the anesthesia involved in the ice? Cardiologists. Yeah. So uh, right now, for example, our watchmen's uh, roughly thirty to forty percent are being done with ice. I think across the street, Brigham, they're doing more, maybe fifty or seventy percent under ice. From what we hear from our colleagues. Um, 
we're still uh, requested to do some TEE once in a while because again, it's hard to predict imaging uh, challenges using ICE. And there are times when, for example, sizing of the device um, or, or the appendage, it's, it's, it's still not, you know, most of these guidelines are built upon TEE use for, uh, for sizing. So we're still struggling to actually, you know, take TEE away during a watchman procedure. So we're still doing TEE and then inter intermittently helping them with imaging, with deployment, with sizing and things like that. Thank you. Otherwise, there's no questions in the Q&A. So. Okay. Thank you very much, Sankal, uh, Dr. Sagal.